first of all, what is, what is our team? So I guess Trend Micro is probably known. don't have to explain what that is. But our team maybe is less known. We're the forward-looking threat research team. We are founded way back in 2008. Um, and basically, we are there to look into the future, you know, the far future of e-crime and user behavior and technology. We're kind of like scouts for the rest of the company. Um, now, I'm actually on the far end of that. You don't normally, but last year, um, we became aware through some other research of, um, of this IPFS thread and thought, okay, let's do something a little more near term. In fact, this came out because we were looking into the metaverse. Uh, we're thinking that might be interesting. That didn't really go anywhere because there's no proper platform uh, there yet that we can study. That, but that led into looking into like cryptocurrencies and also distributed applications and smart contracts. And those are things that are still like ongoing research. Um, but one thing popped up kind of through multiple loops, and that was the IPFS uh, distributed storage system. Kind of in a nutshell, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but like the whole distributed app Web3 stack looks a little bit like this, although there are variations of it, but this is kind of our view of it. And we're going to look at, let me see where this actually works. Um, meh, doesn't work. Okay, good. So I can forget about that idea. So in that case, this is um, what we're going to look at is the actual distributed, um, distributed protocols that are the basis for um, the distributed uh, storage. Um, there is, however, a little bit of controversy about what th Web3 actually is. Um, there is Web3.0, which is, in fact, more something that I'm interested in. It's based on the semantic web, and, um, and it's kind of like an evolution of the current um, web. Very agent-based. There are distributed natures to it, but different from the Web3 idea that is very much more blockchain related and uh, you know, using blockchain as a trust layer on top of a distributed storage system. And there's always some monetary aspect. In fact, it seems to be the only reason why they're doing this is, is because they like the cryptocurrencies. Um, at least in both cases, though, they don't like this whole idea of siloed um, data, which is, and that's something that both of these two visions, um, and if you want to know which one Tim Berners-Lee is in favor of, it's Web 3.0 not Web3. OK, but what, what is IPFS? Um, who's ever heard of BitTorrent before? Well, I guess you've all used it before. Anybody who's not raised their hand is lying. Um, IPFS is very similar, it's, uh, but it's a little bit more professional. It's, it has like a more professional outlook to it. There's some aspects that are, um, that are more useful in a professional environment. But basically, the same idea is there. We have a content addressable network that you're defining. Hey, I'm Alice. I have this document. Uh, I'm going to just advertise it to you know, the, uh, the network. Then uh, somebody, let's say Bob, comes along and says, oh, I'm interested in that document. So uh, he will then figure out who all has pieces of it and then start pulling that in by saying, hey, I want a piece of that document, and, and you'll either get it back or you won't. It's, it really depends. You need to be running a client for, for this to work. Maybe a little, getting a little more technical, the, uh, the content addressing is based on something called a CID. A CID um, in the version zero has, uh, you know, has kind of like a header, but it's basically a digest in the end. Um, unfortunately, they realized that, that this was a bad way of formatting it, and they introduced um, the version one. And they actually mean exactly the same document. But you can see from the top and the bottom that the actual CID is quite different. It's, that's super annoying, as we'll see later. Uh, in fact, probably they'll come up with a version 2 at some point. You know, who knows? Um, an IPFS object is, um, is like some document. So let's say I, I do, on the command line, I do IPFS cat, and then this gobbledygook or so. And then I'll get that, um, that file out of it. Under the hood, however, this is actually a data structure. It's a little bit like a JSON data structure. It's not actually JSON. In fact, um, I can't really show it to you in detail, but uh, the, in the V1 specification, you have a choice of how the data is going to look like. Nice. Um, but in any case, when you do IPFS DAG, you, um, you get, or DAG get, actually, you get the actual structure. And you can see that you, know, you, you can put in data inside. There's also metadata and links to other parts of the file. Um, so it can get quite complex. 
And in fact, when you have a large object, what happens is, and this is why it's different from bit torrent in certain, in certain ways, um, is that you can have like this master document but that starts, once you run out of space in that document, it then links out to other documents. You can also have file, structure, file system structures in it. Um, so you can get quite busy. And the neat thing is, um, this forms a, um, a DAG, not a tree, which means that parts of it can be reused. And, um, and that makes it way more efficient, especially in a corporate environment. Um, directories look like this. Basically, you have, again, this, this JSON-like structure, and it points out to the various other CIDs um, that form the basis of that uh, directory structure. Now, you might, might wonder, where are the integrity guarantees? Well, I guess it kind of should have been obvious that it doesn't need it necessarily because the, the cryptographic hash can be checked by the node when you receive it. In fact, it should be. It usually does. Not all the time, but it should. Um, the other problem that they had was, let's say, if you're going to, I don't know, www.virusbuilding.com, uh, you wanted to always show the latest content. Well, you can't really do that with a CID because it's not, um, it, it's, it, it's basically always that one address will always be that one version of, the file, uh, of that file. So what we need is like a mutable pointer, a pointer that we can then redirect to something else. And that's where another aspect of IPFS comes in called IPNS, name service. I don't know why they thought it was a name service. It's not a name, it's still gobbledygook. Um, the there are some problems with IPNS, and so they, all they have a couple of alternatives. Uh, one is called DNS link. Um, so if you, well, I don't know whether that's going to be very visible, but if you go and look at an IPFS link, it's in the text, a TXT um, field in DNS, and it actually shows IPFS slash, and then again, this, this big hash. Uh, but there's also other services, like Ethereum name service will, can also point to IPFS objects. Unstoppable Domain says something like that as well. So there, there are other aspects. And the reason why we have these is because IPNS is super slow. Uh, you can be waiting like 15, 20 minutes or so for IPNS finally to come back to you and say, uh, I think that's the CID you want. And then you still have to get that. So uh, not very good. Um, so just as like a recap, so the World Wide Web that we all know and love um, is, is very location-based. You have to tell it, here's a server and here's a path on the server. IPFS is content-based. You, you don't really care where it is. You just you care what it is. Um, I, World Wide Web is very much client server. If you learn computer science in the 80s and you know in 90s or whatever, you would have heard of client server all along. Um, IPFS, the idea of doing things peer to peer, you know, is, is slightly more recent, but still, I guess, end of 90s or so. Um, I would say World Wide is very IP centric. We need this address, um, and what we say is in IPFS, it's actually Merkle DAG centric sounds weird, but basically this tree structure that results in a hash is, is the name all for everything. World Wide is fast, we have, we have a lot of technology that deals with it, but IPFS can actually be pretty slow. And I have to say that as a computer scientist, I think, hey, this is really cool technology or so. Um, as a user, I'm not so sure, but um, we'll see what the criminals think about it later. Um, so it is slow, uh, especially the, uh, one of the problems we keep on encountering is that there's really no incentive to keep a object in IPFS on your machine and available. So, and of course, they uh, immediately the Web3 people come and say, oh, well, but that's why we have Filecoin. You know, so we, we can incentivize people to store it for you, and then they use zero knowledge proofs to prove that you actually are storing the object, and yeah, why don't you just have a server? I don't know. Um, it requires uh, the IPFS content to do anything useful with the system. Um, there are some browsers like Brave that, are, that know about IPFS. Um, uh, and I, I've, been, I've been told that in some versions, but not the version I'm using, it actually has it built in. Um, there's the Optera crypto browser that's also aware of IPFS. Uh, and there's, of course, plugins that will allow you to access it. But the consequence of all this is that people don't use I, the IPFS native protocol. Um, they actually use gateways to access their data, uh, the, the data in IPFS. And, and then the question begs the, it begs the question, is this really the de de decentralization that they wanted? Um, but the neat thing is, 
is that every node, it turns out, at least if you're using like the standard Kubo client, is also a gateway. So you, you're, you'll be running a node on your machine. You may be running a node in your corporate environment without even knowing it. Um, because if you have that node running, you have a gateway. Sorry, I was going to say, if you might have a gateway running, or maybe many gateways running in, in your corporate environment without even knowing it. Um, you know, but the reality isn't great. So um, if I say, okay, I want to say IPFS cat and then this gobbledygook thing, it would time out after a while, I get bored. So then I ask for the, uh, for, I actually go to a gateway and the gateway seems to be un, um, overloaded. So that, that just basically go, um, doesn't go anywhere. I, and I finally find that Cloudflare has it for me. Great. Hi, Cloudflare. Very nice. And it turns out to be malware. So, you know. So not so good. So that so it's um, and of course it does trigger most endpoint security solutions. So I mean that's not at least something we have to worry about too much. Um, there are a lot of gateways out. These are public gateways. So this is these are ones that advertise that they're up and running. And the the list changes all of the time. There's no guarantee that they are um, verifying their CID. You know. So so I was saying there's no t there's no TLS really in it. Uh, if you're relying on the gateway to, uh, to validate the CID, well, you have to trust them. You don't have any guarantees there. Um, I haven't seen any malicious ones yet, but that could happen. All right, but what does the data say about this? Because, I mean, I can, you know, I can say this is great technology, and, but it doesn't have any consequences. And um, it kind of, it's a kind of a mixed bag. It, we can still see that it's relatively new. Um, so we looked at the IPFS gateways uh, accesses in our data set, and you kind of see that at the end of 2022, or sorry, middle of mid 2022, it started to get more popular, and now it's waning a little bit and going, going a little bit off. And it's still a very small proportion of our data. So this is similar, it looks similar, but if you look at the percentages, you know, those percentages are actually quite small. Um, however, if you look at its use by criminals in spear phishing, you have like URLs that look a little bit like this. There's actually quite a few variations of, of that URL. And uh, you do see a lot of uh, spear phishing there. And the important thing, from my point of view, is that, um, is that while you know, the, the traffic itself generally has gone, gone up and then went down again, um, the number of spear, uh, spear phishing attacks have been going up gradually. And that, that seems to be uh, the trend that we're looking at. And that's what we're worried about. Um, another like side thing here is that um, last year um, uh, CS Guy, which also was a candidate for being one of the distributed storage medium for Web3, uh, decided to close up shop. Not sure why. And they were super popular with fish for a while. Uh, in fact, that seemed to be their main use for fishing. Um, and, and so what we see, saw at the same time is while CS Guy kind of went down during that period until they actually closed. Um, the IPFS fish started to go up as well. Uh, IPNS is still growing slowly, and the people working on it in the technology side are trying to find a fix for making it work faster. Um, and I don't know, maybe um, just as a side note, the reason why it's so slow is that you saw that you had to kind of enter the, the CIDs into this Kademlia network. Um, the problem that IPF, IPNS has is that you basically have to refresh at least every hour. Otherwise, that message kind of is, uh, disappears and doesn't get cached. And, and so if you stop refreshing, um, yeah, that IPNS address is often not, just not available. Um, so IPMS, uh, IPNS spear phishing also kind of had its moment again at the, when, when, uh, when um, Sieski uh, kind of demise, and then they just kind of disappeared, and now we basically see no IPNS-based system because, yeah, you're not going to wait like a half an hour until your phishing page start, uh, has loaded. I think probably even victims are not that, you know, not that patient. Um, what I wanted to know, though, was um, how many servers um, are hosting um, each CID. And obviously, there's, you know, most of the CIDs, most of the IPFS content is hosted by one single gateway. But, uh, but the, the, the tail is relatively fat. So you can see that even, like, you know, even when you go down to, let's say, I don't know, 100, um, 100 servers for, for one given CID, it's still you know, a relatively large amount compared to all of the other ones. It's, and so 
this, this leads to the problem that people will have if you want to block the content, if you're not aware that you're looking at an IPFS content, then you might be tempted just to block that one server. No, you really have to go and block all of the servers. That server list or that gate, public gateway list uh, changes all the time. So, um, you, know, so you, you end up having to, run, to, to do a pattern you know, um, on the actual um, URL, and that's probably your best option in the end. If that's possible with your product or, your, or however you're doing these things, or if you're just hunting, you need to be aware that the URL, um, well, the domain name is probably not the important part. Takedowns are, by the nature of this, um, nearly impossible. Uh, we have a system that we, tr that we tried, to, uh, tried to use experimentally to find the original hoster of it. Um, and I think you know, by, by setting up our own network, we could figure out, we can get close to it, but we never really can quite get to that server. We can't figure out exactly the IP address of that server. And so finding the uh, source, at the moment at least, maybe until we've found some, uh, some better methods, uh, doesn't seem to be possible. You could, of course, in a corporate environment, say, okay, we're just gonna block the IPFS port. Um, I think it's port 4000. Um, but we're starting to see legitimate use of IPFS. Uh, um, Netflix, as an example, um, claims that they're using IPFS to distribute uh, software containers. You know, so you know, if you're using Docker, you'll know what a container is. And, uh, and apparently they're using that as an efficient method of, of distributing containers over their infrastructure. So not everybody may be able to block IPFS. Um, think about that in a moment. Malware isn't a big thing. So both these values are very low if you think about it. So uh, Cedric last year, Cedric Prenet from a, a parallel group to ours, um, also did some research on IPFS and looked very, very closely at the uh, IPFS uh, malware problem and, real, and found like 180 samples of malware host being hosted in IPFS. Um, when I then decided to repeat it and look at all the data in retrospect, I found zero. And I think what's happening there, it was, and it should be pretty obvious, is that endpoint security kicks in, deletes the objects off all the machines. Whoever originally hosted that piece of malware probably had deleted it anyhow at some point and just moved on. And so, um, so it's, it's, of all the samples, the random samples that I created, I didn't find any malware at all. I guess that's kind of good news. Um, the problem is that there are some blind spots here. Um, I, I can only look at the gateway data, and I can only, and we have we have slightly limited uh, visibility into HBS data. I mean, we can see it, but we can't see it as well. Um, XDR data, um, so from our endpoints, um, is not accessible for me. Um, so I can't see whether people are using the IPFS protocol nat natively and and finding and getting malicious content that way. So there, and there's a lot of like, unknowns. In, in this field that cannot be answered right away. And I'm also relatively sure that the IPFS protocol is not being monitored by most sandboxes and, and uh, network monitoring systems, which would be kind of useful because one of the attack scenarios is, uh, is that you use IPFS for your malware or your second stage uh, malware preferably, and you're completely fine with it, uh, with it uh, timing out, or not timing out, just taking a long time. Because, uh, because you don't care, as long as you get your second stage on the machine eventually, um, uh, uh, it's fine. But a sandbox doesn't want to wait half an hour or so for, for the malware. So, uh, so it, it, it'd be important to monitor that IPFS protocol. Now, while I'm nearly at the end, I, I kind of have to announce that there's another chapter to this, which is probably going to come up some point. Um, uh, a, couple, a couple of months ago, um, uh, Valexia, Valexity um, found a piece of malware that specifically goes out to the various um, uh, gateways to collect, um, I believe to collect the second stage or, or a future comments. And then literally like last week, um, well, okay, so let me back up a little bit. We've been looking at a lot of IPFS objects and a lot of them are encrypted and we we're puzzling, hey, you know, is this legit? Is this not legit? Well, it looks like last, uh, last week we found uh, information from the underground that looks like, yes, indeed, this is da data exfiltration. Um, um, and uh, not only that, it looks like there is a threat actor, and I can't name their name because I'm under embargo, but um, it's also using IPFS for more than just da data exfiltration. So, so this is coming. Um, so yes, chapter two will probably follow. 
So conclusions, uh, can we panic now? No, obviously not. This is still a small problem. Um, compared to not normal fishing, this is not like a huge problem. It's, it's still kind of very low in, uh, in, that, in that field. I think they're still very much experimenting. Will this work for them or not? Uh, and maybe also waiting for IPFS to have a stronger footprint in the market. Um, and also then, of course, hopefully that way it'll become faster. The larger the network, the faster it will be. Um, but the problem that we have is it's really hard to block and hard to take down. Um, the, um, the, we have this protocol blind spot here. Uh, at least, you know, we're not looking into it as actively as we probably should. Um, the timeouts are great for the malware authors and not so great for the sandboxes. Um, and I think the, I, well, while I would like IPFS just to go away, um, I've also said the same thing of crypto, could you just go away? Um, unfortunately, venture capital is really, really into this. Um, and they're throwing piles of money into companies that are doing IPFS, but also IPFS similar uh, technologies. Uh, I mean, like Andreessen Horowitz is, um, you know, funds so many companies in this field. I think they're, they underwrite protocol labs, which is behind IPFS. And I've, one thing I've definitely learned over the last 35 years is not to bet, bet against technology, especially not when there's venture capital behind th something. So this is an attack surface that I think we need to watch. And that is the end of my slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bottom.